One of the things that I think would help us is if we have more citizens asking for our leaders to do this. And especially young people, I think, would see the sense of bending that curve in the direction of recovery, because down that curve lies all our futures. And the implications of continuing on the downward trajectory are too awful to contemplate. I'd like to thank you for coming to another Scientist's Warning program. Your hosts, myself, Stuart Scott, and Victoria Hirth, and we're coming to you live from the Conference of Parties COP24 in Katowice, Poland. There's a contact address I'll show you again at the end. Victoria is an Associate Professor of Sustainable Business with the University of Plymouth. I'm the Executive Director of scientistswarning.org and an Associate of Survival University. Today's guest we have with us is Dr. Tony Juniper, CBE. He's the Executive Director for Advocacy and Campaigns of the World Wildlife Fund. He's also associated with the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership. And today's program, Urgent Action to Restore the Web of Life. Now first, to give a little bit of Tony's background, he is one of the co-authors with Prince Charles of Wales of the book Harmony. Here's another edition of that same book. And here the two gentlemen are together. And here Prince Charles is presenting that book Harmony that they wrote together. Now Tony wrote this book, What Has Nature Ever Done for Us? Sarcastic quip, how money really does grow on trees. And the foreword, you'll notice, is by Prince Charles. And this is Tony's latest book, I believe, published in April? Very recently published, uh, Stuart, uh, April 2018. So a new piece. Okay, we're not selling books, but I imagine it's a, a treasure since this man spends most of his time trying to protect, regenerate nature where it's most threatened. Now, I wanted to present a little bit of a movie uh, that was put together actually by Greenpeace, but uh, this is my initiative. It doesn't represent World Wildlife Fund's perspective necessarily, but it, it's the urgency part of what we're doing today. These are atrocities being conducted against nature. And there's a bar of soap at the end there because a lot of that palm oil that's destroying the Indonesian rainforest in that case comes to us for our soaps and our candy bars and our shampoos. And the footnote is that it's expected that 98% of Indonesia's lowland forests will be gone before this young girl is 25. Again, crimes against nature and humanity. Now, I'll use this point also, again, disclaimer that this is not World Wildlife Fund's initiative. This is my insertion into the program. I've been offering a Climate Villains Award occasionally, and today the Climate Villain of the Day is Jair Bolsonaro, and he's being unwanted for threatening to destroy the Amazon, the most biodiverse region on Earth, for a maniacal ego and to enrich his cronies at the expense of current and future generations. Now, at this point, I'd like to uh, give the microphone to uh, Tony and, and let us have your wisdom. What I thought might be interesting today, Stuart, would be to just widen the conversation at a climate change COP, just to give a reminder of some of the other trends that are in play right now and which are very much related to the subject matter here. This slide um, just setting out uh, a phenomenon uh, known as the Great Acceleration. Uh, some scientists have been working for some time to gather data 
on a whole range of different trends and to reveal how a lot of what is going on is happening in concert. And the first two little graphics with big trends on here show us that the two big drivers behind what's going on, global population increase, growth in GDP, linked to growth in consumption, and then all of these other things that are there in terms of power and water use and so on, all of these things running together into this phenomenon known as the Great Acceleration. That huge and rapid increase in human demand is leading to changes in the Earth system. Again, we're at a climate COP, climate change being driven by changing concentrations of greenhouse gases, that's shown there, but also a whole load of other trends that are happening at the same time. Tropical deforestation in relation to loss of tropical forests in Indonesia. But all of these things really painting a picture of, of how a number of connected uh, questions need to be dealt with together. And one of the things that WWF we are very keen to communicate now is how it's not going to be possible to stop the climate change challenge getting out of control without also restoring the natural environment and how it will not be possible to restore and maintain the natural environment without halting the climate change going above certain thresholds and how neither of these things will be possible unless we have an approach towards sustainable development. So that's what we're drawing out of this great acceleration is the extent to which all of these things need to be dealt with together. Um, before you go on, I want to note to people in the audience that this is not the only COP that happens during the year. There's a COP for the Biodiversity Convention, which is far less known and happened, I believe, in October this year? In November last November. month. Um, but many of the people who were there are not here. The agendas that are being pursued there, largely unrelated to what's being done here in any formal sense. And so even though we do have those two treaty processes, they're running on parallel lines, whereas we would argue they need to be brought much closer together and also brought into the context of the sustainable development agenda. And actually, all of these three things need to be affected and need to be implemented and given effect through a new kind of economy. We need a different economy to be able to do these three things together. Amen. I was just going to say um, that uh, we, of course, have the SDGs, but I noted from a lot of the uh, materials around on the different stands that the use of the SDGs at the same time as thinking about climate change is really quite limited. So that's at least a place that we can start, is saying, to what extent are we tying those agendas in together? I always like to define acronyms. The Sustainable Development Goals that there are only 16 and a half of them. There's a, what we call in America a piker, a fake in there, which is number eight, which is economic growth. And uh, I think, as you said a moment ago, we are not going to achieve what we need to as long as our mindset is we have to keep growing. Well, growth of the current kind is, is yeah. not going to deliver what we need. Uh, we need a different kind of economic system that is looking much more at sustainability and human welfare outcomes rather than bold consumption numbers, which is what we're measuring at the moment. Mm -hmm. so, the, um, so, so that pressure um, coming from this great acceleration then is manifest in a series of threats to the natural world. Uh, this just reveals um, a breakdown that shows how habitat degradation is really the biggest one, followed by exploitation, that's hunting and overfishing, for example, the effects of invasive species and diseases, pollution, including industrial pollution and some coming from agriculture, and climate change impacts on top. We can see that a number of different pressures are coming together to transform the face of the earth right now. The thing I pick out here is that dark red piece, the habitat loss and degradation. This is being driven largely by conversion of land to facilitate agricultural expansion. And this is then linked to changing consumption patterns amongst people, not only the number of people, but very much driven by, for example, high impact foods becoming much more uh, widespread in people's diets, uh, so the Western diet, rich in meat and dairy products, leading uh, to um, that red piece becoming bigger uh, as we try to feed more people with these kinds of destructive diets. So, so this, is, this is then the key way that biodiversity 
loss drives climate change then, is it? Because that habitat yeah. loss is loss of forests, which yes. are key to regulating our climate. Exactly that. And so this is then another moment when we can see the need to have a joint and integrated agenda. Because as you say, the destruction of the forests and also the degradation of the soils mm. is putting billions of tonnes of carbon into the atmosphere mm. at the same time as causing the extinction and loss of wildlife. Mm. And so if you want to either stop the extinction or stop the climate change, mm -hmm. you have to do both together. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the danger is we won't do either. Isn't there another key driver um, in that it's loss of areas, but one of the key drivers of biodiversity loss is literally putting a road through a large piece of habitat, which can have just as dramatic effects. Yes. Now, of course, those roads then are there to uh, transport or use of transport, which is driven by fossil fuels. So there's another yeah. key connection there. Yeah? Uh, one of the key drivers, undoubtedly, is the development of infrastructure. And so when roads and ports connect what were once remote areas of, of habitat with global markets, those remote areas of habitat very often quickly disappear, especially if there is fertile soil beneath the rainforest or the savanna that's there. So the development of infrastructure is definitely a big part of that habitat degradation piece and also the exploitation piece. So what we can see here is the pressures on the natural world mounting in relation to the pace of the great acceleration. And then we can begin to measure some of the consequences of this in terms of declining wildlife populations. So this is a diagram that is drawing on material presented in WWF's Living Planet report. There we produce a piece of research called the Living Planet Index. This basically is monitoring changing vertebrate populations, mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, over time. And you can see this decline in the total populations, that dark line revealing the trend. And we just published the most recent iteration of the Living Planet report to reveal that in the year in which the data stops, 2014, we can now show a 60% decline in animal populations since the baseline year of 1970. Isn't so this is less than one human lifetime. And isn't that right, that we had already gone through a massive destruction of nature before 1970? Exactly. So the 1970 baseline is already a depleted point. Yeah. If you went back 500 years, we'd already lost some big animals as a result of human activities. But by the time you get to 1970, we're way down on the natural state. And then you can see we've gone from even that depleted place to where we are now in a very short time. Yeah. Shocking is too mild a word for this. This is mind boggling. And I believe within this past year, a few scientists have reported that insect populations yes. have declined 70 or 75 yeah. percent. Indeed. Mm -hmm. So we have data. And actually, that brings us to the next slide, Stuart. This is a decline in populations. Obviously, when a population reaches zero, you have an extinction. And this gives us a little sense of the shape of the curve in terms of the rate of loss of animals and plants right now. And in the middle there, in the inset, you can see uh, something relating to invertebrate populations. And you can see the big numbers that are decreasing, uh, the dark red showing the increasing, which is only a small proportion of beetles. But the insect population crash that's going on alongside the vertebrates in some ways is more troubling because this is the base of many food webs. Those invertebrate animals sustaining many populations of mammals and birds. And of course, these are pollinators too. Mm. So 70% of the world's crop plant varieties depend upon insects for their pollination. And of course, this is then beginning to raise questions about food security. Maybe come to some of that in a moment in terms of what this means for people. It means but we're this, screwed. It, 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 longer term, it will do if we don't do something. But this diagram is just simply showing the extent to which the species loss has increased. And this is the beginning of what could turn into a mass extinction of species on planet Earth, literally not seen for 65 million years. And the last time this kind of change occurred when the Earth collided with a comet or an asteroid uh, marking the end of the dinosaurs. So we are entering a period 
that very soon will look like that in the distant future fossil record if we don't change what we're doing. And so that brings me then to this, possibly the most important point, is the need for a new deal for nature and people. This is at the heart of what WWF is now calling for. And you will see that we're describing here in that green line a period of long-term decline and the opportunity in 2020 for the world to come together to be integrating what it's doing on climate change, what it's doing on biodiversity, what it's doing on sustainable development, to slow down the loss so that by 2030 the trend is reversed. We'd be entering into a period of very low carbon development, heading towards net zero, and we would be in a period of ecosystem restoration, leading to the reversal of those trends I just showed you earlier, in terms of the population loss at least, and avoiding that mass extinction. So we can do this. Humankind can do this. This is within our gift. The question is, do we have the global collective political will to put in place a deal for nature and people that will signal that the moment has come where we now will embark on this historic project. And in 2020, we will have the 75th session of the United Nations General Assembly. And at that meeting, we are calling on world leaders to put in place a declaration that will do what I just described. Increase ambition to stop the mass extinction and restore nature. Increase the ambition to phase out greenhouse gas emissions. Increase the ambition and urgency of actually implementing the full package of the Sustainable Development Goals and to see those three things as an integrated plan underpinned by a global declaration from heads of state. That's what we can do if we decide to do it. And one of the things that I think would help us on that journey is if we have more citizens asking for our leaders to do this. And especially young people, I think, would see the sense of bending that curve in the direction of recovery by 2030, because down that curve lies all our futures. And the implications of continuing on the downward trajectory are too awful to contemplate. And we had very strong words yesterday um, from a group of students from Berlin, and we've had Greta Thunberg, and we've had young people standing up absolutely disgusted at the lack of action that's happening on climate change. Now, for those, those young people, it's sometimes been only in the last year or so they've actually understood anything about climate change. Now, what we're saying, and it's a necessary part, is they can't just understand about climate change. They need to understand more than that because they need to get angry, not just about what's not being done on climate change, because if we solve climate change and we don't solve these other issues, we are in just as bad position. And there is a real risk that we do not provide solutions that deal with the whole picture. Indeed, and we were reminded by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in October this year, through the medium of the 1.5 degree report, that actually we can't even solve the climate problem unless we get to grips with the continuing degradation of the natural environment. Mm. That needs to be stopped and reversed. And we talk a lot about negative carbon technologies in these kinds of meetings. Um, we actually have one already, and we know it works. It's called a tree. Should we reforest large parts of the earth that are currently denuded of their tree cover, that will remove a great, great deal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So would a return to sustainable farming and rebuilding soil organic matter. Both of those things are about the recovery of the natural environment and would have a hugely beneficial effect on the carbon equation, mm. should we invest that way quickly enough. And, and including what's under the ocean. I know uh, we have a lot of work going on in Plymouth around sea grasses. Yes. And there's a lot of potential, like you say, for, for, for solving these problems together. Alternatively, we do something incredibly stupid, uh, like we did when we went full-blown down the, the, the biofuels track, yes. thinking that this is going to be a, a, you know, a golden right. chalice to our problems. Yeah. The issue is, if, there's, if we decide that one solution is going to do this for us, it is no doubt going to be the wrong solution, because if everyone piles into one solution, you create another problem. We need a diverse well, set of, issue, of we, solutions. We do, and we need a holistic and integrated approach, because any one thing looked at on its own is never going to be 
a solution. It, mm -hmm. it might be contributing in the right direction. On that subject, Victoria, I would say, and certainly for WWF, this has now become clearer and clearer to us, is the extent to which at the heart of that recovery curve is action in the food system. So we have a rising population and we've had a change in diets sustained via some really quite destructive agricultural choices. Industrial farming and monocultures have denuded the natural environment, but as a result of moving towards these high impact foods of dairy and meat in particular, we've put multipliers on top of the food system in ways which have really not helped. And I think, you know, at times some people they kind of assume that we've had to do that because we're short of food, because of that rising population. Well, the fact is we're not. So we are feeding at the moment about 40% of our crops to farm animals to sustain poultry, pork, meat diets. We are wasting about one third of the food that's being grown. It's not getting to people. And we have a global obesity epidemic. You put those three things together, we are not short of food. What we have become used to, however, is feeding this machine of industrial agriculture to produce cheap food, in inverted commas, but now as we realise what the costs of the degradation of nature and the impacts of climate change will mean, this is not cheap at all. No. It's very, very expensive food. Whereas a few people might benefit from the profits that are created, but it's going to come back in loop to all of us. Yeah. Now I'm going to <clears throat> insert my... Uh, New York attitude here uh, and say that my British colleagues are way too polite. Uh, I think the problem is that we have a bunch of scoundrels out there in, in our political leaders. Um, the corruption of the system, whether it's overt corruption or covert corruption, and the covert can take a couple of, of forms. One, illegal payments, but the other is that the whole system has been corrupted because we have these fictitious persons called corporations. Now, you and I, we're real human per persons, and we understand that we will die someday, and certain things will kill us more quickly. But this fictitious person, this corporate idea, has no concept of its own death, and so, therefore, why not exploit nature to the breaking point? The corporation, just in its own persona or non-persona thinks it will go on forever. So we've got a system where our companies and the, the structure of money and economics is killing us and we don't see it. Well, this um, brings us back to the point earlier about the economic system and what is becoming apparent, ever more apparent, is the utter misconception that that downward green trajectory makes economic sense. Even from the perspective of the current economic system, it doesn't make sense because the whole thing is underpinned by a functioning biosphere. And some of the corporations who are a little bit closer to this, those in the food and the water sectors, for example, can see that actually the long-term future of their organizations is in doubt. Mm -hmm. And whereas the corporation might have thought it never dies until quite recently, the impacts arising from soil damage, climate change, mm. the seasonal impacts on agriculture, the difficulties of securing sufficient fresh water, all of these things will begin to feed back into the bottom line in ways which are going to jeopardize even the current system. Yep. So what we have to do is understand that in the end, the economic system is underpinned by nature. Mm. Society is a function of the natural environment and the economy is at the top of that. And what we've unfortunately done is to become confused to the point where we see the economy as essentially the thing that runs the planet, when in fact our economic system is a wholly owned subsidiary of nature. And the more we damage nature, the more we imperil the human world. Yeah. And so this is a new argument, I think, that is becoming more understood by some e economic thinkers. Some of the economic thinkers who've managed to break out of their yeah. um, free market delusions and the growth delusions that brought us to the current predicament. But there's a lot of work to be done. And actually, if there's one group out there who really need to get behind this idea of a global deal for nature, it's the economists, the ones who've understood the data and understood what's really happening in the world, 
rather than those who simply look at economic numbers and can see those functioning in a way which is utterly divorced from the reality of how this planet works. Now, unfortunately, we have come to equate the word economics with a particular brand of economics, neoclassical, neoliberal economics, that was installed about 100 years ago by J.P. Morgan. We have other, the, the quote that you just gave about a wholly owned uh, subsidiary, that the human economy is a wholly, that comes from Dr. Herman Daly, who founded, uh, I call him the founder of ecological economics. There are other systems, but they've been pushed to the side by the current system. So when you read economics, when you hear economics, they're talking about a particular brand of economics, mm -hmm. which is growth forever. But the business leaders, um, there is a big and growing number of business leaders, like you say, that get this, that are trying to go on a journey to become purpose-driven, but it needs the stakeholders to really work with them and to support them on that journey because it is not an easy situation to be in. We yeah. need business to change and we need to support business to make that change. Okay, now uh, we've used up our time. Your hosts today, Victoria Hearth and myself, Stuart Scott. Our guest was Tony Juniper, and you can contact us at contact at scientistswarning.org. We've been coming to you live from COP24 in Katowice, Poland. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.